Right. Well, as I'm sure you all know, the four last things are death, judgment, hell, and heaven. Um, today we're going to be dealing with death. And the grouping was put together in the 12th century, and it was affirmed by the councils of Florence and Trent as church doctrine. By the 15th century, they were seen as a really suitable topic of contemplation for Advent, which carried on, really, it's only rather dropped out of disfavor in the last 50 years or so. The season of waiting for the appearance of Christ was seen to apply as much to the second coming as the first. But before we progress to thinking about the last things, we do need a little bit of background. In the medieval mind, the present was a small place between the beginning of the world and the end. To understand the latter, we have to, an idea, have to have an idea of the former. Now, for medieval people, the story of creation as told in the book of Genesis was a scientific account of the world and its beginnings. Even such an imaginative painter as Bosch saw the world through this filter. Here, on the external doors to his garden of earthly delights, he shows the creation of the world. God up in the left-hand corner and the heavens above, the tiny flat bit that is the earth and then the space under the earth. There's one of that, there we go. So day one of creation. This ivory panel from the Cathedral of Salerno and dates from about 1084, shows the first day of creation. In the first panel, the spirit of God moves on the face of the deep. God divides the light from the darkness. It's all very simple. And in the other panel, God can be seen seeing by the angel's reaction that it's all good. In this later version, in the east window at York Minster, things are not quite so straightforward. Light and dark are divided, but so are the angels. While the majority worship God, a few, shown in red, rebel against him and fall from heaven. On the second day of creation, God makes the firmament and divides heaven and earth. The east window at York shows the division, surrounded by spectacular red clouds looking rather like a poppy wreath. <laughs> On the third day, the Lord makes dry land appear. At his command, trees and vines spring forth. And the, and the trees have a wonderful orchard of fruit. On the fourth day, the Lord sets the stars, sun and moon in the heavens to govern day and night, the seasons and the years. And on the fifth day, he brings forth all the creatures of the skies and seas. For the first time, the birds take wing in the, in the heavens and the waters teem with fish and great whales. And God tells them to increase and multiply. On the sixth day, God makes man in his own image. In, in the Morgan Bible here, there's, a, there's the special relationship between God and man is shown as God takes Adam's arm and gives him dominion over all the creatures of the world. And this wall painting from St. Agatha's church in the Easby shows the moment where God puts Adam into a deep sleep and then creates Eve from his rib. On the seventh day, God rested. I really like this. The left-hand piece of 20th century glass from Sir Death Reader's Ely Place, showing God resting, all very, very quiet and calm. York also shows the seventh day, and God rests surrounded by angels while creation adores him, and man kneels before him. Now, the Bible itself makes no mention of the creation of the angels, but the medieval church had no doubts they were created on the first day. This probably derived from the book of Jubilees, which is an apocryphal Jewish book, which says, on the first day, he created the heavens which are above and the earth and the waters and all the spirits which serve before him. This illustration is from Harley manuscript 3240, Speculum Humane Salvationis, and it's German work of the 14th century. The idea that Satan and his angels rebelled and fell in the moment of their creation is based on the writings of St. Augustine. Yet as soon as Lucifer was made, he turned away from the light of truth, swollen with pride, 
and corrupted by delight in his own power. Accordingly, he didn't taste the sweetness of the happy angelic life. Surely he didn't receive it and turn his nose up at it. Rather, being unwilling to receive it, he turned his back on it and lost it. In this version of another German copy of the Speculum Humanae Salvationis from about 1360, we see the rebellion of Lucifer, who demands God's throne, supported by, here is Lucifer there, and here are his, his, Lucifer's angels. You can see they're not wearing halos. And the good, the good angels look on rather sorrowfully. The Morgan Bible shows this as, as the first day of creation. God starts creation holding the earth here and the heavens there. Meanwhile, Lucifer and his angels rebel and are cast from heaven and immediately turn into horrible creatures. Subject continued to challenge artists well after the medieval period. This is a spectacular bit of ivory carving from Naples about eight, early 18th century. This, the whole thing is about 11 inches high. And here we have all the angels falling from heaven and right down at the bottom, the fall of man. Here we have Adam and Eve tasting the forbidden fruit and driven out of the garden. Those are from York Minster. So now to death. And this is an early representation of death seen as a fallen and hermaphrodite angel. This is from the 11th century Tiberius Psalter. I particularly love his wings composed of dragons. Very unusual. Now, before the arrival of the Black Death in the 14th century, death was seen as a normal part of life. Not really much more than that. This picture shows part of the mortuary role of Lucy the foundress and first prioress of the Benedictine nunnery of Castle Hedlingham, and dates from about 1230. These mortuary rolls would be used to announce the deaths of well-known or important religious people, a bit like a Times obituary. And they'd be taken round local communities asking for prayers to be said for the diseased. Here we see the crucifixion of Mary as Queen of Heaven with the accompanying prayers. And at the bottom, Lucy's body lies in her open coffin, surrounded by mourners, while above it her soul is being carried to heaven by angels, demonstrating she's led a good religious life and will be rewarded hereafter. But with the shattering impact of the Black Death, things changed abruptly. This striking fresco in the former abbey of St. André de Lavadure in France from the 14th century, soon after the arrival of the epidemic, shows death personified as a woman, she carries arrows that strike those around her, often in the neck and armpits. In other words, places where the buboes commonly appeared. She's no respecter of persons. We see popes, bishops, clergy, and nuns among her victims. And certainly the mortality among clergy during the Black Death was disproportionately high, owing to their attendance at deathbeds. And this early 16th century painting of the Justinian plague outbreak of 536 shows the terror induced by the speed and lethalness of the infection. Death starts to take on a nightmarish quality, typified by this representation of the death of a whore painted by Hieronymus Bosch. It's a really frightening picture. The fear of infection and the increased presence of the unburied dead during the Black Death also gave rise to a fascination with the mechanics of decomposition typified by this page from a copy of a cheery little poem of the 15th century called The Disputation Betwixt the Body and the Worms. Here we see two images of the deceased. A colorful effigy of a richly dressed woman contrasted with her decomposing corpse below. Death as the great leveler. Her wealth and status don't mean anything once she's dead. All the creatures going in and out of the shroud are really very splendid in that. So we move to a good death. The other effect of the Black Death was this increased awareness that death could strike at any time. Life in towns was always risky, but if you lived, as most people did, in a rural community, if you survived childhood and childbirth, you had a good chance of living to a good old age. Epidemics of infectious diseases changed all that. 
You might die at any time and very quickly into the bargain. Medieval Christians hope for a good death, ideally at home, in bed, surrounded by family with a priest administering the last rites. To die a bad death meant dying unprepared, without the ability to confess one's sins, increasing the chances of going to hell. In this French book of ours, from about 1380, which contains the office of the dead, specific prayers and rites designed to help people to a good death, we see the image of a priest administering the sacrament to a dying man. The Ars Moriendi, The Art of Dying, was a handbook on how to make a good death, which was very popular during the 15th century and was widely available in affordable woodblock printed copies. This is before movable type, but you would you were still getting printed books by that period. It went, went through the temptations that assail the dying man, preventing him from making a good death and how to deal with them, together with prayers to be said by both the witnesses and the dying. So, the first temptation you had was that of losing your faith. So the demons draw up a curtain between the dying man and Christ. Yes. And so all he can see is heresy. When the temptation is vanquished, the angel on the other side reminds him of all the biblical examples of faith. So we see Christ, Mary, Moses, and innumerable saints. Then we come to the temptation of despair. The devils remind him of all the sins he's forgotten. So the angel reminds him of God's forgiveness, citing the penitent thief, Mary Magdalene, St. Peter with his crowing cock, and St. Paul on the Damascus road, falling off his horse at the bed's foot. The third temptation is impatience. Here the patient lashes out at his nurses and knocks his food and medicine to the floor. His angel reminds him of the patient suffering of Christ and his saints, Lawrence, Catherine, Barbara and Stephen. The fourth temptation is complacency. The devils lead him to pride in his wonderful faith and patience. The angel reminds him he's a sinner and unworthy of salvation, but that he must trust in the mercy of the Trinity and the prayer of the saints. The fifth temptation is a preoccupation with worldly things, which includes his family. All the dying man's attention is focused on his possession and his relatives as he listens to the demons. The angel invites him to contemplate Christ on the cross. Mary watches over him and he sees the saints welcoming him into heaven. Meanwhile, another angel politely ushers his relatives out. In the picture of death, in Hieronymus Bosch's 1485 painting of the seven deadly sins and the four last things, the time for the Viaticum has passed. The dying man has been anointed with holy oil and given a candle to hold as the priest reads the prophesiscary. Go forth, Christian soul, from this world in the name of God, the Almighty Father who created you. In the name of Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, who suffered for you. In the name of the Holy Spirit, who was poured out upon you. Go forth, faithful Christian. May you live in peace this day. May your home be with God in Zion, with Mary, the Virgin Mother of God, with Joseph and all the angels and saints. Bosch not only shows the clergy and presumably a doctor at the bedside, but also death, about to finish off the dying man and a vanquished demon and an angel rubbing its hands in delight at a good death. Meanwhile, in the next door room, life carries on as usual. Here we have the moment of a good death. As St. Guthlac dies, he is born again to eternal life with the aid of two angel midwives. This is the, from the 12th century Guthlac roll. You can see here, here out of his mouth comes the, the soul in the form of a baby. Of course, the very best death of all in terms of the safety of one's soul was martyrdom. Even if there was no opportunity for you to undergo it, you could see it portrayed on the walls and meditate on it. Here are the last two stages of St. Catherine of Alexandria's martyrdom in Pickering Church. So she, they attempt to break her on the wheel and she breaks the wheels of the, the machine. But finally, she has her head cut off. 
making a very, very good death indeed. Some churches actually bear the scars of historic martyrdoms. This pillar in the University Church of St. Mary of the Virgin Oxford shows the ledge cut into it to support the platform where Thomas Cranmer stood to be tried. And behind it can be seen the modern memorial to the Oxford martyrs, both Catholic and Protestant. Now we move on to the more technical side of things, burial and mourning. Now among the earliest definitively Christian burials are those in the catacombs of Rome. Roman law forbade burial places within city limits, and so all burial places were located outside the walls of the city. The first large scale catacombs in the vicinity of Rome were dug from the second century onwards. Many of these tunnels were first dug for build, mining building stone. From these quarries, vast systems of galleries and passages were built on top of each other, joined by steps that descend as many as four stories. Burial niches, loculi, were carved into the passage walls, like these ones here. Um, bodies were then placed in them and the loculus was sealed with a slab bearing details of the deceased. Some families were able to construct cubicula, these elaborate rooms, which would house various loculi and architectural elements of the space would offer a support for decoration. When space began finally to run out, other graves could be dug in the floors of the corridors. Formae. Despite widespread modern popular ideas, these tunnels were probably not used for regular worship, at least at first, but simply for burial. However, extending pre existing Roman customs, memorial services, and celebrations of the anniversaries of the Christian martyrs took place there. In 380, Christianity became a state religion. At first, still many wanted to be buried alongside the martyrs. However, this declined slowly and the dead were increasingly buried in church cemeteries. In the sixth century, catacombs were used only for martyrs' memorial services. And by the 10th century, catacombs were practically abandoned and the holy relics had been transferred to above ground basilicas. But for most pe medieval people, burial was a simple affair. The body was wrapped in a plain white sheet, often ornamented with a red cross, and placed in a grave in the churchyard, accompanied by the priest intoning the prayers for the dead. As you can see in this, the last of the seven acts of mercy in Pickering Church. Later on, um, the burying and woolen acts of the late 16th, 17th century required the dead, except plague victims and the destitute, to be buried in pure English woolen shrouds to the exclusion of any foreign textiles. An affidavit had to be sworn in front of the Justice of the Peace, confirming burial in wool. There's one of these affidavits. The person responsible for laying out the deceased had to swear that only wool had been used. The affidavit was often a handsome affair, had to be shown, then had to be shown to the parson responsible for the burial, who had to include details in the burial register. Laying out the dead often seems to have been the responsibility of a small group of older matriarchs within a community. And you find the same names cropping up in affidavits over and over again. Here, yeah, this example is an entry from the Deddington Burial Register for the burial of Elizabeth Painter on the 5th of November, 1684, where the oath had been sworn by Jane Parsons. It was the sixth time Jane had done this in the, in the previous five years. She herself died in 1694 one in her mid seventies, having laid out half the village. In this miniature of a burial from the eyes of the Umfrey family, about 1420, we see the burial itself. The family, presumably fairly wealthy, um, in heavy black mourning cloaks, watches the grave digger places the shrouded corpse in the grave, while the clergy read prayers and sprinkle holy water. In order to reduce their time in purgatory, people would pay for extra prayers to be spoken at their funeral, and if they could afford it, on the anniversaries of their death. The reason I say they're fairly wealthy is you, to be able to afford a black cloak of that scale, purely dedicated to funerals, meant very, very much wealthy. Black cloth was expensive. Another manuscript shows the coffin in which the corpse had been brought to the grave. You can see the corpse is not being buried in the coffin, but 
the body is then lowered into the grave and up in the top, you can just see St. Michael flying over to receive the soul of the person who is being buried. Usually only the very rich or the very holy were buried, buried in, actually buried in a coffin. St. Cuthbert's coffin at Durham is heavily decorated and clearly would have been on display for some length of time. So its function is not really so much as a, a burial thing as a storage of a, a, a relics function. Again, in the case of the rich and holy, attempts might be made to preserve the body of the deceased, often by wrapping the body in seer cloth, that's wax linen. In January 1852, builders demolishing the medieval chapel royal of St. Stephen in the Palace of Westminster found an uncoffined body wrapped up tightly in seer cloth. Laid across the body diagonally were, was a wooden crozier, indicating the burial was probably that of a bishop or abbot. The body had been wrapped with great care and effort. About 10 layers of seer cloth were used to cover the body, and this had solidified into a mass that had to be cut to gain access to the contents. The trunk, head and legs were individually wrapped in layers, and then the body was secured along its length with twine, knotted in various points with a half hitch. The upper arms were wrapped in with a torso, but the lower arms appeared to have been left free, and the delegation concluded this was in order that the body could be positioned to hold the crozier. No other grave goods were found, and there was no evidence of embalming, but the body had just turned to grave wax or adipocere. When the tomb of Edward I in Westminster Abbey was opened in 1774, his body was found tightly wrapped in seer cloth, as shown in this image by William Blake. A crown was placed on the wrapped head of the king, and the mortuary scepters lay on his body. Edward had experienced a particularly long interim period between his death on the 7th of July, 1307, and his burial on the 27th of October, enclosed in his coffin above the ground. He died in Burby Sand, and his body was brought about 300 miles to Westminster via Waltham for burial. As a result, his embalming had had to be top notch. On removing the inner coffin lid and the face covering, the antiquaries in attendance found the king's skin had been tanned rather than rotted. His facial features were distinguishable, though the nose had shrunk and his eyeballs were still visible. His regalia had also been well preserved. He wore a crown. His hands were wrapped finger by finger and he held a scepter and rod. His feet were covered by figured gold cloth and seemed to be intact. Although some of the more delicately made things, such as his gloves, appeared to have deteriorated to dust, the vast majority of the body and grave goods of Edward I survived till at least 1774. Richard II seems to have become preoccupied with his death and burial, and his will of 13, in his will of 1399, he requested burial in Westminster Abbey with his wife Anne, in More Regio, in the royal way. If he died away from London, the procession carrying his body to Westminster should cover 14 to 16 miles per day, if possible. 24 torches would be burning at all times during the liturgical hours and masses and masses that would be said at each stop. But once the funeral procession entered the capital, another 100 torches were to be added so that all of London would see it. Richard required no fewer than four hearses for his body to rest under during the obsequies, with the involvement of at least two churches. St Paul's London and Westminster Abbey, the latter receiving the best hearse. If Richard's body lay beyond 16 miles, then the executors had to choose the four most important churches for the hearses to be set up in, each being equidistant from the next. However, if he died in Westminster and there was no need for a huge procession, only one very grand hearse was required and there should be four days of solemnities. The last day should have the grandest services possible to compensate for the lack of grand procession. A hearse, incidentally, was a wooden structure built to hold the coffin and numerous candles. This spectacular hearse is illustrated in the Islip roll showing the funeral of Abbot John Islip in 1532 in Westminster Abbey. And you can see this spectacular construction just for the funeral. Richard wished to be buried in a robe of white velvet or satin with a crown and scepter without jewellery and precious stones, except a ring on his finger, valued at 20 marks. Richard set a budget for his funeral, 
the colossal sum of 6,000 marks or 4,000 pounds, including transport to Westminster. That's roughly equivalent in today's money of 28 million. Richard's will doesn't give any details of the treatment of his corpse before burial, but Matthew Paris gives a fairly detailed account of King John's death at Newark. On his deathbed, John had expressed a wish to be buried close to the shrine of St. Wollstone at Worcester. To carry the body that distance in a seemly manner, clearly the corpse would have to be, if not mummified, at least treated in some way to prevent decomposition. Paris says, therefore the abbot, the most skilled in physic of all the Crookston canons, and the king's doctor at the time he departed this life, opened up the body of the king so that it might be transported more fittingly. He lavishly sprinkled the viscera with salt in his own house and arranged for the honourable burial of the body. Presumably John's innards were suitably buried at Crookston. I always envisage the, the abbot sort of saying, I didn't sign up for, for being an undertaker when I took this job. But basically, he was a medic and so he had to do it. This disemboweling and treatment with herbs, salt and pitch became fairly standard for royal corpses partly to enable the lying in state. The De Exequis Regalibus in the late 14th century, uh, basically a handbook of how to conduct king's funerals, gives the rules for the preparation of the king's body. First, his body should be washed by his chamberlains with hot or warm water. Then it should be anointed with balsam and spices all over. Then it should be wrapped in a wax linen cloth arranged so that the face and beard are fully visible. Then the said seer cloth should be arranged round his hands and fingers so that each finger and thumb of both hands is separately wrapped as though he were wearing gloves. The said servants should take care of the brain and of the viscera. These would have been removed before the washing. Henri de Mondeville, an early 14th century doctor, directs, when the body must be preserved for longer than four nights and when granted dispensation by the church at Rome, open the abdominal wall and remove all the abdominal viscera then liberally apply the following powder to all the inner surfaces, equal parts of myrrh, mummy, aloes, spices, and herbs that prevent decay and lessen bad odors. Add salt to equal the quantity of the others. Fill the abdomen with sweet smelling herbs, enough to fill out the normal contours, then sew the incision and complete the embalming process. If you must preserve the viscera, cover them with a the powder and place them in a silver or a lead jar, which you seal with many layers of wax cloth. These instructions would comment about granted dispensation by the Church at Rome, reflect the ban on partial burials by the Pope as a result of the practice of boiling down crusaders' corpses to enable their bones to be brought home. Despite the disapproval of the Church, the separate burial of body parts, especially the heart, seems to have been popular with the wealthy. This rather lovely heart brass is that of Anne Muston at Saltwood in Kent, who died in 1496. The inscription says, here lieth the bowels of Anne, Dame Anne Muston, and her remains are being taken up to heaven by an angel. Richard I, with Lionheart, died in 1199 and 41 while fighting the French in Chalice. In according to his wishes, his heart was removed and preserved separately from his body and was buried in the cathedral at Rouen in Normandy. During excavations in 1838, a lead box about the size of a large book was discovered and found to have contained these remains. The organ had been embalmed, then wrapped in linen, and recent forensic analysis reveals that it was the remains of a human heart and that despite repeated stories he was poisoned, Richard the Iron Heart died of gangrene. On his deathbed in 1329, Robert the Bruce of Scotland asked his heart to be carried into battle against the infidels because he had not been able to go on a crusade himself. Excavations in 1818 found his ribs had been sawn through, indicating his heart had been taken from his body. Sir James Douglas is said to have taken Bruce's heart in a casket with him to Spain, but in a battle against the Moors, Douglas was killed, which is why the Douglases have a crowned heart on their coat of arms. The heart was brought back to Scotland and buried in Melrose Abbey. A casket supposedly containing his heart was excavated at Melrose Abbey in 1996, though it had been excavated previously in 1921 and then reinterred. It had been opened 
1921 and the heart photographed doing a certain amount of damage to the casket. So the conservators merely verified its presence using an endoscope before the casket was enclosed in a time capsule and reburied. The Prince Bishops of Würzburg took the idea of heart burial to a new level. From the 13th century, a tripartite burial rite was the norm. Immediately after they died, the heart and intestines were removed and preserved. The entrails were placed in a container, preserved with lime, and then interred in the castle church at Marienburg. The heart, present through the day's long funeral service, ceremony, was embalmed and put in a glass vessel. The body was also embalmed, then placed in a seated position. It, the, the heart and the corpse were carted on a bier from Marienburg Castle to St. James's Abbey, where the body was displayed for one night. The next day, the seated corpse and heart were carted over the bridge to the Würzburg Cathedral for the second ceremony. The corpse was displayed at the cathedral on top of the baptismal font for one day. Then the body and heart were taken to the monastery of Neumünster for a third ceremony. The body was then returned to Würzburg Cathedral, where it was buried, and the heart was then taken 30 miles west to be interred at Eberach Abbey in the spectacular monument, which contains the hearts of several bishops. As the fashion for disemboweling and embalming royal bodies declined, it was mis much discouraged by the church. An effigy was used instead for display before burial, and a number of these have, been, have survived. These two are the effigy heads of Henry VII and his wife Elizabeth of York, which are preserved at Westminster Abbey. I think the one, the one of Henry VII is an absolutely amazing thing. After being brought into the church, the coffin was placed under a hearse, a metal frame which suspended candles over the body while it rested in the middle of the church for one to three nights before burial. Sometimes, however, it was simply placed on coffin stools and candlesticks placed round it. Then the clergy would sing the office of the dead. Most parish churches owned a simple hearse cloth for all parishioners to share, but among the wealthier classes, it was common to commission a specially embroidered cloth to ensure the deceased would be remembered. We now move on to the walking dead. At Stanford-on-Avon in Northamptonshire in 1500, Henry Williams, vicar of Stanford-on-Avon, made his will and he wrote, I will that the glass windows in the chancel with imagery that was therein before, also with my image kneeling in it and the image of death shooting at me. Another window before St. John with imagery in it now with my image kneeling on it and death shooting at me. These should be done in small quarrels of as good glass as can be gotten. And the window still survives. Here he is with death shooting at him. It's typical of pictures reminding people of the ever present nature of death. Death could appear at any time without the hope of ensuring you were ready to appear before God. Chief of these reminders was the Dance of Death, otherwise known as the Dance Macabre. This consists of the dead, or a personification of death, summoning representatives from all walks of life to dance along to the grave. In this example, from Nira Erslav in Denmark, we see a king, a bishop, a young nobleman, and a merchant. It was meant to remind people of the fragility of their lives and how vain were the glories of earthly life. As a point of interest, the word macabre seems to derive from an Arabic word, Maccabir, meaning cemetery. This may suggest that the motif had its origins in Spain or Southern Italy. The earliest recorded such painting is the lost mural on the south wall of the Cemetery of the Holy Innocents in Paris, which was painted in 1424 to 25 during the regency of John Duke of Bedford. With its emphatic inclusion of a dead crowned king at a time when France did not have a crowned king, the mural may well have had a political subtext. The painting, along with the ossuary, was demolished in 1669 and replaced by housing, and no detailed contemporary illustration of it survives. However, it may well have resembled this superb 15th century example from St. Robert's Abbey Church at La Chez Dieu. We do know that the dance on the wall of Cimetière des Innocents was painted between August 1424 and the Lent of 1425. It quickly achieved fame and the text was published with accompanying woodcuts by Guy Marchand of Paris in 1486 and it quickly became incredibly popular. 
Both texts and pictures are full of satire and humor. The portly abbot is told that the fattest person is the first to rot. Death makes eyes at the young lover and he grabs the physician by his crotch saying, oh, that's where your urine sample came from, is it? Among those who saw the Holy Innocence painting was one John Lydgate, a monk from Berry St. Edmunds who visited Paris in 1426 and straightway set himself to translating the in, in, into English. He added a few extra characters, notably some female ones, and it wasn't long before a version of his version was painted on the walls of the Northern Cloister at St. Paul's Cathedral. John Stowe tells us, there was also one great cloister on the north side of this church. About this cloister was artificially and richly painted the Dance of Macabre, or Dance of Death, commonly known as the Dance of Falls. The like whereof was painted about St. Innocent's Cloister in Paris. The meters of, the po of this dance were translated out of French into English by John Lydgate, monk of Bury. The picture of death leading all estates at the dispense of Jenkin Carpenter. Sadly, this did not survive the Reformation. Stowe tells us that in 1549, on the 10th of April, the said chapel by command of the Duke of Somerset was pulled down with a whole cloister, the dance of death, the tombs and monuments, so that nothing was left but a pot of ground which has since converted into a garden. Now, the Guild of the Holy Cross in Stratford-on-Avon was founded in 1269 as a haven for poor and retired priests providing accommodation and living expenses for them, together with a handsome chapel. After the Reformation, it continued in use as a charitable institution, provided almhouse accommodation. However, the decoration of the chapel was regarded as papistical, and one John Shakespeare, William's father, was tasked with whitewashing the interior, which he did. Later generations also covered the walls with panelling, and so the wall paintings were preserved. These included a fine doom, and a set of paintings in the chancel showing the invention of the true cross, finding of the cross. The rest of the chapel was given over largely to reminders of mortality for the elderly clergy who used it. One of the best preserved and most visible today is the Earth Upon Earth painting. Dating from the 15th century, it shows an angel flanked by handsome buildings and two men regarding a shrouded and worm-eaten corpse. The poem, the between, running between these are scrolls bearing verses from a poem, Earth on Earth, which plays with the idea of dust thou art and to dust thou shalt return. Behind the tasteful panelling of the north wall, and far more difficult to pick out, runs the dance of death. It appears to be a copy of the St Paul's dance and to have illustrated the whole of Lydgate's text. Currently very little is on display, pending conservation, but this panel shows a restoration of death dancing with a patriarch and a king. And this is how they may have looked. From a, this is from a computer reconstruction of the interior of the chapel by York University. There's no surviving text of these superb panels from a dance of death in the choir at Exum Abbey. They seem to show the cardinal, the king, the emperor and the pope. John Stowe says that the St. Paul's dance was painted on wooden panels, and these may well represent it, rep, resemble it in this respect. But these are among the best surviving panels of Dance of Death. There are a couple of surviving panels in Newark in the Malcolm Chantry Chapel. These were painted in the early 16th century on stone. So on the left, we have the dancing skeleton flourishing a carnation, which is a symbol of mortality the flesh flower, and pointing to the grave, and on the right a well-dressed young man with his hand on his purse. His elegant outfit and stance are rem reminiscent of a young Henry VIII, and I don't know if that's who he's supposed to represent. At Sparham in Norfolk, while the late 15th century rude screen is not strictly a dance of death, it's very closely related. On the south side are two panels. In the first is a skeleton in a shroud pointing to a font, I should have been as though I had not been born. I should have been carried from the womb to the grave. And in the adjoining panel, a female skeleton offers a male skeleton a flower. And the inscription reads, man that is born a woman hath but a few days and is full of trouble. He comes forth like a flower and is cut down. These quotes are both from the book of Job. And these spectacularly grisly scenes are parodies of two of the sacraments, 
possibly the other five did not survive. Related to the dance of death is the motif of the three living and the three dead, a morality tale that sees three kings meet three skeletons who say something to the effect, as you now are so wonderful we, as we are now, so shall you be. Originally, it's a secular tale made popular in the 13th century French court, but by the 15th century, it emerged in devotional lay manuals, often accompanying the office of the dead liturgical prayers. As an embodiment of the idea of death, the three living and the three dead have become a striking and very visually persuasive image. This is a miniature of, the, of it fr from, from a, the Delisle Psalter made in East Anglia in the early 14th century. And if you go to Ron's church in Northamptonshire, you have got a spectacular, huge version of it. The three noblemen standing out hunting, standing in a field full of rabbits, confronting the three cadavers standing in a bare, rocky landscape. Ron's church paintings are amazing. In Lancarfen Church in Wales, there's only one young man, gorgeously apparelled, in the height of fashion. His dead counterpart, clad in his winding sheet, peers round the corner of the window, em window embrasure and grabs him. A Germanic variant on this story is shown in the 16th century fresco painted on an ossuary wall in Bar in Switzerland. It shows the legend of the grateful and helpful dead. In the Bar version, a man is chased by a band of thieves. Sheltering in a cemetery, he kneels down and prays for help. Grateful for the prayers, this man piously says, so that their souls may rest in peace. The dead arise and walk out of their graves to protect him, some with scythes, some with sticks. This tale was widespread in Switzerland and to a lesser extent in Germany. The legend of the grateful and helpful dead reminded people to pray for the souls of their loved ones. Instead of being a menace, the fleshless corpses lend a hand to the people crying out in fear. People of the Middle Ages were surrounded by the ghosts of the unquiet dead. There's a splendid collection of local ghost stories collected by a monk of Byland Abbey in the 14th century. One such is the story of the haunting of Snowball, which is very specific in names of the places involved. Snowball, a tailor from Gilling, was riding to Ampleforth when he saw a crow-like creature. That's a Gilling church. Plunged to earth. He went to pick the bird up, but he saw flames shooting out of it. Terrified, he crossed himself and drove it about a bow shot off, it then turned to a chained dog, and Snowball advanced holding his sword crosswise. After conjuring it in the name of the Trinity and by the five wounds of Christ, he discovered it to be the spirit of an executed murderer requiring absolution. The story then tells how he obtains an absolution, which he buries in the man's grave in Gilling churchyard, and keeps a prearranged meeting with the ghost. It appears in the form of a goat, then it and its two companions in the form of figures like the paintings of the kings of the dead. The ghost says that as a result of Snowball's action, they and 30 other spirits will enter heaven next Monday. They'd tell him to amend his life. He could only see them because he hadn't been to mass that week and accompany him to Ampleforth where he lies sick for about a week. We now move on to the artifacts of death. All the things you find in churches and around churches that are there because of death. For some churches, the limited size of churchyards could be a problem. If space was limited, then some other means of forming the, storing the remains of the departed was necessary. It was believed that at the last day, the dead would be reinvested in their earthly body. So at least the long bones and skulls needed to be preserved. Charnel houses and chapels were widespread in English churchyards and churches in the medieval period. They were designed to house bones that were disturbed when new graves were dug. While none of those surviving in England are as elaborate as some continental examples, like this one, the Church of St. Ursula in Cologne, two survive with their contents in England, Rowell and Hyde. In a corner of Rowell Church in Northamptonshire is a small door leading to a narrow staircase down to a crypt. At its foot is a doorway leading to a vaulted room piled high with bones. These are mostly human, but include animal remains as well. This 13th century structure was rediscovered in the early 18th century, when a sexton digging a grave against the south wall of the church found himself falling headlong onto a pile of bones. 
He'd fallen through a window in the wall, which was buried under the soil. Legend says he went mad with shock. What he found, him, found himself in probably looked fairly like this. This is a 19th century photograph of the interior. On the east wall here, there are the sad remains of a painting that seems to be either a doom or a resurrection, which leads us to the conclusion this was probably a chapel rather than simply a storage place for bones exhumed from the churchyard. It's thought the ch chapel was designed to be regularly used by the congregation. People entering the south door of the church would clearly be able to see through the two sub-ground level windows into the crypt. There may also have been an aperture in the ceiling of the crypt towards the east wall, permitting light from the church above to shine directly onto the wall painting below and to allow masses set at the altar to be seen while in the crypt. The bones were stacked in piles around the space, but have more recently been reorganized with selected skulls on shelves around the walls and the breath in big wooden bins in the middle. A selected five skulls have been subjected to carbon-14 dating, which produced a range of medieval dates from the 13th to the 15th centuries, together with an 18th century skull, this one here, which had been opened presumably by an anatomist, and the 19th skull, century skull, which seemed to have been varnished. These two latter suggest that the crypt was seen as a suitable place for disposing of curios after it had been reopened. The Church of St. Leonard at Hythe in Kent is perched on a steep hillside above the town. And while it has an extensive graveyard, much of this seems to be a modern extension. Inside the chancel is, inside, the chancel is raised very, very high the flight of about nine steps between it and the nave, you can see. It's a mountaineering feat to get up to the high altar. That's because you have an ossuary underneath the chancel. It doesn't seem to have been accessed from the church, but rather by two doorways on the north and south sides, suggesting it originally formed part of a pilgrimage or processional route. The collection consists of shelves and four arched bays that contain over a thousand skulls in total and a single stack of bones and skulls measuring 7.5 meters in length, 1.8 meters in width, and just over 1.8 meters in height. It's thought many of these were exhumed from the churchyard when the church was extended in the 13th century. Others may have come from churchyards in the area that belonged to churches that were closed and demolished during the medieval period. When the land was sold, those buried in the churchyards were exhumed. All the bones that have been tested are at least 700 years old. Some may be much older. They don't seem to have been removed originally to the building they reside in today, but were taken to a charnel house which stood in the churchyard. Skulls and thigh bones are the most robust bones in the human skeleton and most likely to survive, so these are the ones that are usually retained when a grave is exhumed. The first written accounts of these bones appears in the late 17th century, describing an orderly pile of dead men's bones in the crypt. Clearly by this time the original charnel house had been demolished and the bones relocated. It's not much more than 100 years since the skulls were arranged onto shelves and the huge stack of bones was constructed. Not medieval but interesting is the 19th century Mort House that stands in the northwest corner of the old Kalsaman churchyard in Aberdeenshire. Here, the lower floor consists of a vault built for the purpose of storing coffins in safety until the bodies they contained were useless for anatomical purposes. As the vault's partly underground, the entrance is reached by a short flight of descending steps. Then you've got two doors, an outer one of wood with two enormous locks, and an inner one of one inch solid iron with two more locks. The interior of the vault is arched with stone and was originally fitted up with three tiers of shelves on which up to 12 coffins could be placed. These could stay there for up to six weeks, by which time all danger of the bodies being stolen was passed. The room above the vault, which forms the upper story of the building, was occasionally used as a watch house in cases where the corpse had been buried in the churchyard without having previously been stored in the vault. A small charnel house survives, though without its contents, at Nunnington in Kent. It's not the most dramatic of structures, but it is a listed building. It's 19th century and it's in a dark and secluded corner of the churchyard. You had to really look for it to find it. And it's now used as a store for lawn mowers but it was originally used to reverently store those human remains disturbed by grave digging and gardening in the churchyard. By and large, church burials did not contain anything in the way of grave goods. A notable exception to this was the burial of priests, whose bodies were often accompanied by artifacts that identified their role. 
This small leaden cross was buried with the body of a 12th century priest at St. Augustine's Abbey in Canterbury. Bishops and abbots would be buried in full regalia and a crozier would be buried with them. This bishop's crozier of walrus ivory and his Episcopal ring comes from a late 13th century bishop's grave in Garda in Greenland. But most common was the burial of a chalice. These are usually upright, so it would seem they were taken to the graveside and carefully arranged on the corpse once it was in the grave. This little pewter chalice was buried with the chaplain of St. Nicholas Hospital in Carlisle during the 13th century. Excavations carried out in the nave of Litchfield Cathedral have shown a great deal of detail about the way that medieval priests were buried. This 13th century priest was buried in a wooden coffin, which was covered with a dark cloth with a red cross painted on it. On top of this was placed a small cross made of two twigs. Next to that was a pewter chalice with a paten resting on it. A folded linen cloth covered the paten and below the cloth were the remains of a Eucharistic wafer. The inside of the chalice was pitted, probably the result of it being filled with wine when it was buried. The implication of this is either he was being buried with the body and blood of Christ, or that he, was, he expected to continue his Eucharistic function in the next life. Rather more upmarket is this superb chalice and paten, together with his Episcopal ring, from the grave of the 13th century Bishop Sutton of Lincoln, that you would be buried with pieces of this quality, is a statement of the power and riches of the Bishop of Lincoln. An exception to the limitation of grave goods to the clergy is the burial in Worcester Cathedral of a 15th century man who clearly made the pilgrimage to Compostela. He was buried in his pilgrim boots, carrying his staff, and with a pierced cockle shell, possibly from his hat. I couldn't entirely ignore funerary vestments, so here is a taster. Between 1569 and 1600, the royal workshops of El Escorial produced a solemn mass set in black and silver, which survives in the keeping of the Royal Monastery of San Lorenzo del Escorial in Madrid. Most spectacular among the varied pieces is the cope, a full length cape worn over the other vestments. Made of an amazing black and silver brocade, it employs several skull motifs in stump work as part of the broad silver embroidered orphrey and hood. Just amazing work. How long it took somebody to do, I tremble to think. Corpse roads, likeways, and coffin paths are all much the same thing. These are the tracks made by generations of rural families bringing their dead to church to be buried. This example is the path now simply known as Zena Field Path, distinguishing it from the coast path. The path links the churches of St. Ives and Zena with the scattered farms along the clifftops, enabling them to get to the nearest church. The styles along this path, though, still show its original use. They're known as coffin styles and the predecessors of the cattle grid, enabling the bearers to cross the substantial Cornish hedges without climbing. My ancestors lived at one of these farms, Wicker, and many of them would have been carried three miles or so along this lovely path to Zena Church. Corpse roads survive best in remote parts of the country, notably the Lake District. This is part of the corpse road between Wasdale and Eskdale in the Lake District, by which the dead were taken to Boot Church. Besides some of these tracks, coffin stones survive. These are big flat stones which the bearers could place the coffin on while they took a breather. This coffin stone at Town End is beside the corpse road from Ambleside to St Oswald's Church, Grasmere, and is marked by several such stones. Closer to home, some of these paths do still survive. This is the church path that links the old chapel of Ease, St. Leonard's in Moulton with the old parish church in Old Moulton. A similar path linked the parishes to the villages of Broughton and Swinton with their parish church to Motherby. Sadly, it's now built over between Swinton and Motherby, but the section between Broughton and Swinton is still there, marked only by local memory and walkers. Most people couldn't afford a coffin and were buried in their shrouds alone. Many parishes owned a parish coffin in which the corpse would be carried to the grave. Only two of these seem to survive, both curiously enough, in Yorkshire. This is the Howden Minster parish coffin, dating from the 17th century and now kept on a 19th century beer in the church. Another parish coffin, 
probably slightly older, survives at Easingwold. But considering its rarity, it could be better displayed. It's in a small glory hole area under the stairs to the West End Gallery. And opening it reveals a slightly odd assortment of socks. Why Easingwold decides to keep socks in a coffin is beyond me. At Old Malton, a shelf for the parish coffin survives, built into the churchyard wall. Again, it probably dates from the 17th or 18th centuries. This monstrous object is a 19th century iron mort safe coffin in Collington Parish Church, Midlothian. This was designed to protect the corpse from body snatchers, an issue that seems to have obsessed 19th century Scotland. Another mort safe in the churchyard at Cadder in East Dumbarton. Beside this is a watch house to guard further against the theft of bodies. Burke and Hare seem to have ensured that these are a feature of every churchyard within range of any Scottish medical school. They do occur in England too, though they're a lot less common. This one is in the north side of the churchyard of East Mersey, Mersey Island in Essex. Here the local legend, almost certainly untrue, is that she was a witch and the mort safe was to prevent her walking. There are a huge range of monuments in churchyards which we cannot hope to look at in detail. I'll have a quick look at a few standout ones. Here we have a rather nice tombstone come bench at Bybury in Gloucestershire and a distinctly odd wheel with ram's head in Ludenham in Kent. An intriguing 18th century gravestone in Lastingham churchyard. The front is a perfectly conventional inscription with a cherub's head, but the back seems to represent a doorway into the hereafter. Unusually, despite being in the churchyard of a grade one listed building, it is deemed worthy of a listing in its own right as grade two star. Family plots can be very striking, like this amazing group of 19th, 20th century Carrara marble memorials at Sheldwick in Kent. They dominate the whole churchyard, and if, if the light is right, they really are spectacular. Even when he died, the congregation at Beverly Minster must have felt the vicar still had his eye on them. Your late pastor, TM, being dead, yet speaketh. And some memorials are just very different, like this extraordinary example at Nonington in Kent. I just, extraordinary, you need, you need half an hour to read it. But be aware of the broad and narrow roads. Mausoleums or houses for the dead are relatively rare and are usually, but not always, family graves. This is a fine one in the churchyard of Little Ousburn. And the, in, inside you have a room in, interior with the grating to the vault below. For sheer eccentricity, it's hard to beat the mausoleum of Sir Richard Burton and his wife in the otherwise sedate graveyard of St Mary Magdalene Church in Mortlake, where you have a mausoleum in the form of a 12 foot by 18 foot stone replica of a Bedouin tent. During the 19th century, as churchyards got larger, often with extensions separate from the main churchyard, wheeled biers were very common for transporting the coffin from the church to the grave. Many churches retain these, usually parked in a dank corner, like this rather unusual three-wheeled one in Goodeston in Norfolk, sometimes on display as at Blythe. They're usually fairly simple, a platform mounted on spoke wheels with or without springing. Some are more handsome like this elegant piece of carpentry at Cardington in Bedfordshire, which has now found a very practical use as the church bookstall. Or this one, whoops, at St Andrew's, Stogacy in Somerset, with a cage over which the parish pall could be draped. In some churches, they're still in use for the purpose they were intended for. Here at Eberston, the grave was being dug and the beer was already waiting at the roadside to take the coffin up the narrow path to the church. The word hearse has two separate and often confused meanings. These days, the carriage on which a coffin is carried is known as a hearse, whether horse-drawn or motorised. And I simply couldn't resist this spectacular Spanish motorised hearse. It really is something else. During the 18th and 19th centuries, many rural communities had a communal hearse to carry coffin bodies from outlying homes. And the building housing this vehicle and its accompanying horses was a common sight in rural churchyards. The relatively few survive, 
This Hearst House at Cholderton in Northumberland is thought to have been built when the church was restored in 1830, and it clearly makes use of older fabric from the church building. At the left is the garage for the hearse. Inside was stabling for six horses, though only three stalls are left, as the other set were removed in the 1930s to provide space for the village post office, of which the counter and storage cupboard still remain. However, in the Middle Ages, a hearse was also the stand for candles, which was placed around the coffin during the service and sometimes surrounded the tombs of the wealthy. This late 14th century book of ours shows the spectac a spectacular blue hearse as the center of a royal requiem mass. The coffin, draped with a red pole, is visible underneath. A rare survival in functional order is that surrounding the late 14th century tomb of Sir John Marmion, who died in 1387, and that's in West Tanfield. The effigy of Sir Hugh Calverley, in 1394 at St Boniface Church in Bunbury in Cheshire has a simpler hearse with pricket candle holders all around him. And the spectacular Warwick tomb is furnished with a fine gilded Latin hearse. This seems to be purely a support for a pole rather than a candle stand. The candles on the hearse will be lit on the anniversaries of the death, the year's mind, and also on All Saints Day. In Sweden and some English parish churches, parishes, the light of, can of candles both inside and out the church still takes place for all saints, all souls and remembrance. And here we finish with the two inevitables, death and taxes. <laughs>